my name is Ross. You'll remember me from the last panel. I still work at Loading Law. I'm still an adjunct professor, and I still work with independent game developers on trademarks, copyrights, contracts, and anything else that they get in trouble over. Uh, this panel is going to be legal basics for game developers. We're going to be going into all of that stuff, plus privacy. And I'll let my co-panelists introduce themselves here. Uh, I'm Suzanne Jackie. I was on an earlier panel too, but I didn't introduce myself then. Uh, I'm from the IE Law Group, which is a law firm out of Los Angeles that focuses exclusively on video game clients. So we don't work with anyone that isn't somehow connected to games. Uh, I am actually not in Los Angeles, though. I'm in DeKalb, which those of you who are local knows this tiny little town about an hour west of Chicago. It's wonderful. Um, I work remotely. Our clients have no idea where I'm actually from. They just assume Chicago. When I'm not being an attorney, I work with a nonprofit that specializes in mental health and games, um, and I try to advocate for that in my spare time. I'm also project manager for the Video Game Bar Association, which is a bar association for attorneys who work primarily or exclusively with video game clients. All right. Uh, I have not been on a panel earlier today, so please pay attention. <laughs> Uh, my name is Sam Castry. I'm the head of the Entertainment Law Division at Crawford Intellectual Property. Uh, you heard about that from Mark Wibble earlier. Uh, same firm. And uh, I have been working with uh, indie game developers for pretty much my whole career as a lawyer, uh, including a couple people in this room. Glad you made it. And we do all kinds of stuff. Trademarks, copyrights, uh, all manner of contracts, which I'll be touching on. Um, we don't do a whole lot of patents for the game developers, but for other people. And um, I'll stop rambling temporarily and pass it on over. All right. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is I actually um, am certified in privacy law in the U.S. through an organization called the IAPP, which is the International Association of Privacy Professionals. Um, it's a certification that even non-attorneys can get. Um, you basically study the local laws for whatever jurisdiction you're being certified in, and then you take a really difficult test and hopefully pass it. And I did. Um, but it's a wonderful organization for useful tools and information about what's going on in privacy law right now. So this is a wonderful quote um, about how U.S. privacy law works. Basically, we don't have one overarching privacy law here in the U.S. We don't have one thing you can look to and be like, all right, these are the kinds of things that I can't collect without disclosing. These are the types of consent I need. It's a patchwork, which makes it really difficult to comply with sometimes. Because not only is it a patchwork on the federal level, it's also a patchwork on the state level. Every state has different <coughs> sets of regulations that you're expected to comply with if you're collecting data from citizens of those states. So, why are you collecting data in your games? Um, and I hope every game developer in this room is collecting some kind of data. Um, you should be collecting email addresses and things of that nature for marketing purposes, player names. Um, you should be collecting play times, when people are rage quitting your game, data about where they're located, what hours they're playing in their location, um, interactions they're having with other players in games, maybe by tracking them through a username. You're also probably unintentionally collecting data. If you've ever pulled code from Google, which I know none of you have because that might be copyright infringement and clearly you would never do that, um, it might have something that's just collecting rogue data somewhere in your server. Or if you have an ad server, which we'll talk about later, that's putting ads up during your game, you're going to have similar issues where they might be collecting data on your players that you're not even aware of. So. Today, because I have 15 minutes and I'm trying to cover all of privacy law, um, we're going to go over some of the U.S. privacy regulations really quickly. I'm also going to go over some state regulations that are of particular interest to game developers. Um, the last two pending legislations on this slide are, uh, are not law, so I'm not going to tell you what they say or how we're going to deal with them, but they will impact games in the future. So lawyers in the room, keep an eye on the Illinois Geolocation Privacy Protection Act, especially if your clients are tracking where people are, and the Illinois Right to Know Act, which will deal with um, data portability and access to the data folks have collected. We've already covered a lot of fun things about the FTC, and they're back again for um, privacy purposes. They're the primary federal body that's going to enforce these types of laws that deal with privacy. It falls under the... Uh, unfair or deceptive acts or practices section of law. When you're collecting someone's data, you need to let them know why you're collecting that data, that you're collecting that data overall, and a couple other things. 
Before we move on, I do want to specify that the government doesn't care about all the data you're collecting. They only care about specific types of data, and that data is typically referred to in the law as personally identifiable information. And what personally identifiable information is varies by law and may require a combination of different factors, but it tends to be information that can be used to, to identify or contact a particular person from a group. So things like a first and last name, an address, an email address, a telephone number, a social security number. In addition to personally identifiable information, you have sensitive personally identifiable in information, which is things like the social security number, the credit card number, the unlisted phone number, that are going to require a higher degree of protection. So we'll start off with something really simple and straightforward that no one should ever worry about. I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, is probably one of the laws under which game developers most often get in trouble in terms of privacy. Um, it controls what you can collect and under what circumstances from children under the age of 13. So if you're making a game for kids, knowing this law inside and out, or contacting an attorney who's familiar with this law and can tell you about its restrictions is hugely important. Um, it includes things like making reasonable efforts to provide direct notice to parents, about what kind of data you're collecting, how you're storing it, when you're deleting it, who you're sharing it with, and how you're using it. But it also includes things like making sure those parents consent to that data use and have the ability to stop that data use at any time. Um, it also requires that you establish and maintain reasonable procedures to protect the confidentiality, security, and integrity of the personal information collected from children, and that you delete that information as soon as its purpose is fulfilled. There's a whole list of um, rules that COPPA is subject to, and the FTC actually is very helpful, uh, and they make this list clearly available on the website for anyone to go on and access. So, why are we talking about COPPA? Because there have been a lot of violations. The general um, fine for games that have violated COPPA range from $50,000 to $300,000. Um, this particular case was... Um, a game developer that was collecting data and not um, disclosing its full storage and safety limitations. So when a leak occurred, instead of going after all of the leaked data, COPPA fo or the FTC focused on the leak of email addresses and passwords from children, since those were stored securely according to the procedures that were set forth. TinyCo, um, sorry, catching up with my own thoughts, um, failed to disclosed that they were collecting children's information in exchange for monetary or in-game currency and email addresses. So basically, TinyCo wanted people to enter their email addresses in exchange. They got a certain amount of in-game currency. They then used these email addresses for marketing. They weren't tracking whether or not their players were under the age of 13, and they weren't tracking how those things were being stored, and they were certainly not disclosing parents that any of this was happening. W3 Innovations had a, game, had a series of games called the Emily Games, including a game called Emily's Dress Up and Shop. And basically, you could go in and you could interact with Emily by sending her emails or posting on the forum. Um, and W3 decided that they didn't need to tell parents that children were posting publicly, usually with private information, and that they were privately emailing the company. Finally... The first, one of the first developers that was found to, uh, to violate Kappa was actually found to violate it because of a third party advertiser. And this is where I'm going to stop and talk to the developers for a second. If you hire an advertiser or you contract with, contract with an advertiser to take care of your ad serving needs, you are responsible for what they do in your game. The FTC did not go after the ad server here. The FTC didn't ask um, can we see the contract? Did they promise and pinky swear that they wouldn't collect data from children? The FTC did not care about the contract. The FTC cared that that game was collecting information from children under the age of 13. So you as the game developer, you as the lawyer advising game developers, needs to be aware of precisely what your uh, vendors are doing with data. Next law. See, we can totally get through all these laws. All right, so can spam, um, which I, everyone please take a moment to appreciate my super clever graphic. It's can spam, it is a can of spam. 
It was up late. It, I thought it was hilarious at the time. I even posted about it on Twitter. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so anyway, can spam is the act that requires you to give your users options in terms of what kind of marking they receive. This is the tiny unsubscribe button at the bottom of your emails. Um, who here that sends email marketing uses MailChimp or Constant Contact or a similar email service? Okay, so as a general rule, those types of marketing services are going to have can spam compliance built in. Usually when you set up the account, they demanded that you tell them your physical address and your real name and a contact information for someone, and then they directly through their systems comply with the unsubscribe procedures described in can spam. But if you are handling it directly as an individual, maybe through a spreadsheet, or if you're collecting email addresses at a convention and just writing them down and then sending people emails that are advertisements for your game and aren't giving them the option to say, reply to this email and I'll unsubscribe you from the list within a week or um, click this link and I'll remove you from my Google Docs spreadsheet. That's going to be a violation of can spam. And in addition to uh, the penalties, the civil penalties that non-compliance can bring, it also provides for criminal penalties, which are very rarely imposed but are for things like using false information to register for multiple email addresses or domains to send spam email. So if you have advertising at mygame.com, and then you also have ads at mygame.com, and also information at mygames.com, and you are sending emails from all of those different email addresses, and perhaps under different addresses or something like that, you're going to have to really consider whether or not that's going to be enough for criminal liability, because really, it's not worth going to jail to advertise your game. You would get lots of coverage on the game development websites, but it wouldn't be the kind of coverage that would sell your game. Another thing that uh, is provided for in criminal penalties is relaying or retransmitting multiple spam messages through a computer to mislead about the origin of a message. So forwarding it through multiple email addresses, so maybe it's not from mygame.com anymore, maybe all of a sudden it's from Kotaku, is a problematic thing. Now for some cam spam compliance. These are the really simple, straightforward things you can do to be compliant with can spam. And like I said, most advertising clients and hopefully your advertising companies that you're working with if you aren't using a client on your own behalf already comply with these things, but you are the one responsible for the compliance. Your company is responsible for these particular types of things. All right. Almost there, guys. All right, so now we're gonna to get to some state restrictions. Um, obviously, I'm going to focus on Illinois law here because that's where we are. But like I said at the beginning of the presentation, every state has privacy laws, and a lot of them are different, and some of them even directly contradict each other. Um, in particular, your breach notification laws, there are some just straight up contradictions between state laws. So you can't send a blanket breach notification to your players in all 50 states and expect it to be <coughs> compliant in all 50 states. Do you mean like state v. state contradictions or within it, like a state in itself? No, state v. state. So okay. like, you know, one state will have a law that says that you should include the name or what type of data was disclosed. And then another state will say, don't put any of that information in the notice. Um, so knowing those kinds of limitations, really, if you have a breach, you're already in a lot of trouble. So speaking to an attorney or encouraging your clients to speak to an attorney when they've experienced a breach is one of those best practices that we can all get behind because it's not an easy thing to handle, not only logistically but emotionally, knowing that you've betrayed your client's trust or your customer's trust and that their information is all floating out there because you couldn't keep track of your Excel sheet on your laptop that has all of their credit card numbers or whatever. Please don't store credit card numbers in an Excel sheet. <laughs> Um, Cal OPA, though, will apply to almost every game developer you work with. Cal OPA is the privacy policy law. Um, it requires that every state or every website that's available to a resident of the state of California have a privacy law that's um, accessible from the front page. So basically, it has to cover the types of information gathered by the website, how the information could or will be shared with other parties, how users can access, review, and make changes to collected information, and information about how your website handles do not track signals. And those things have to be on that privacy policy on that website if it's accessible to people in California. 
Now for some Illinois stuff. So the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act um, applies to any business that collects biometric, da biometric data from Illinois state residents and says that they must develop a written retention policy that is available to the public, restrict the uh, disclosure of biometric data, and protect and store the data at, for, at at least the same level of protection as their other confidential information. Um, there's a private right of action of um, $5,000 and $1,000 for each negligent violation. So basically, this comes up and is interesting in games because there was a lawsuit related to this particular law in games. 2K, does anyone play um, Take Two's 2K15 NBA game? Did it, anyone here? Okay, so it's a basketball game. It's the NBA bit. Um, and they could scan your face using your Xbox or PlayStation or whatever system you preferred, and then port your face into the game so that you were the one playing the game. Like, you were a professional basketball player, which is something we all aspire to be. Um, so some Illinois residents got together and claimed that 2K did not let them know exactly what they were doing with the data, how they were storing it, and there wasn't enough affirmative consent in terms of how the data was going to be used or that the data was being collected at all. Um, the court didn't even get to the merits of the case. They said that the Illinois state residents didn't have a concrete and particularized injury. It, there was no evidence that 2K had shared the data or wasn't storing the data securely. They just kicked it out. Um, so we don't really know what kind of concrete and particularized, particularized injury you would need to have to have this law apply. But clearly the court is looking for more than they took my data without complying with the restrictions of this law. I am not an EU attorney. Um, and I'm not even going to pretend to tell you exactly what this means. I was actually at a conference recently that spent an hour trying to touch on the very basics of this, and I've been watching a series of videos that's on its fourth hour um, trying to explain the specifics of the GDPR. So the GDPR is going to apply to companies that have are collecting data from EU citizens. Um, it's going to become effective next May, and really a lot of things about it are um, in the air. So things like you're going to have to hire a data protection officer who has expert knowledge of data protection law and practices. I don't know what that person looks like, and they haven't made it clear what specific requirements they're going to have for that kind of person. Additionally, only organizations who store large amounts of personal data will be required to have that person. But what's a large amount of personal data? So it's a, it's a big question mark for anyone who is currently collecting data from those citizens. Um, it's something you should definitely be in close contact with your legal counsel, or if you're an attorney, should be in close contact with European counterparts in terms of figuring out what these things mean as they move forward. But we have less than a year to prepare for something, and it's coming. And that should be like really ominous music behind me, um, because a lot of people collect data from all of their players, regardless of whether they're in France or the US. And if you have that kind of data, you're going to be subject to this law. So now that I've terrified you and spoken really quickly about a bunch of things, um, let's talk about what you can tell your clients about moving forward in terms of their privacy needs. Or you as game developers can do right now without like crying in the corner over all of the data you have that's probably breaking laws um, to move forward and be okay. So the first step is gonna be sitting down with all of your team, or by yourself if you're a one-person team, and figuring out, okay, I have this ad server, what data are they collecting, what data am I collecting, who has access to it, where is it being stored, is that secure, basically figuring out the nature of the data you have. Um, and encouraging your clients to do this before they approach you about their privacy needs is very important, because you as an attorney are probably not qualified to go into someone's databases and say, here's exactly where you're collecting data. I see this line of code. It says you're collecting email addresses. Um, as brilliant as most attorneys are, we can't read code to the level of determining exactly what data your clients are collecting. So having your, your clients sit down and figure out their data is a great first step. And starting with the really difficult projects is a good first step because those are going to be the ones that are going to get your clients in trouble. Those are going to be the ones that get flagged by the GDPR when it finally comes effective 
and having something that says, well, I have these data collection policies and procedures and these data retention procedures is really going to help with that. Um, remind your clients and developers know that privacy is a process. It's not one phone call and one bill and then you're done and you don't have to worry about privacy compliance ever again. Um, it's an ongoing process knowing where data is coming from, how it's being stored, whether or not that's compliant with current laws, whether or not there's anything on the horizon you should be aware of. Um, you should be able to have conversations with whoever is your privacy expert, preferably a lawyer, um, about what your daily operations are in terms of storage, management, passwords, um, and protecting your data. Um, when you're looking at your data, you really want to look at the types of requirements I went over super briefly, which are all of my slides will be in the materials. Um, and also Google is your friend, just saying. Um, you're really going to want to look at the current requirements and future requirements. So that whole EU thing that's coming in May of 2018, you're going to want to know a vague idea of what they're going to want from you so that you can start now tailoring your storage and collection procedures to agree with that. Because it's not like you can wait till April and then be like, no, no, I got this. I'm just going to revamp our entire program and policy so that we can handle this appropriately. And finally, monitor your vendors. That ad server that you have, if they're collecting data from kids under the age of 13, that's going to fall on you. Um, if there's a rogue snippet of code that someone inserted when they were working for you as a programmer from Ukraine or wherever, and they're collecting data through your program, that's also going to fall on you. So be aware of not only what your vendors are doing, but also the contractual obligations that you put on them. Indemnification clauses are wonderful for this exact reason. Um, if, I, if I had a client who were hiring an ad server, I would make sure there was an indemnification clause in there for privacy violations, because I don't know, I can't track what that ad server is doing all the time. I'm done. Right. We're good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call this next section uh, IP and business basics at 88 miles per hour. So <laughs> yes. hold on to your butts. Here we go. Uh, first of all, we talked about some intellectual property earlier today. We talked about patents. We also touched on briefly uh, trademarks, trade secrets, and copyrights. We didn't get too deeply into what they are. I'm not a patent attorney, so I will not talk about patents with you today, but I will spend some time getting into some copyright basics. So a copyright is an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium of expression. What that means for all of you game developers and for any of you attorneys that are working with this is that Copyrightable material comes in a lot of different forms in video games. It can come in the music, it can come in video, it can come in artwork. Uh, video games are such a visual medium that almost every element in them is a copyrightable piece of content. Copyright is one of the most easily accessible legal protections for game developers because it has a very low price point, either $35 or $55. Um, there are some advantages to registering a copyright. So for example, if you want to start a suit for copyright infringement against someone else, there's going to be a requirement that you're, you have a registered copyright in that. Uh, the question that people always ask me is, what about mailbox copyrights, poor man's copyrights? Can't I just mail something to myself and now it's copyrighted? No, stop asking me that question. There are better <laughs> ways to do this that are cheaper than mailing things to yourself. Um, and always my retroactive disclaimer for the day, I'm not your lawyer, at least not yet, so what I'm providing is not legal advice, it's just legal information, and that'll apply to all of our uh, other panelists as well. Uh, a couple slides that I have here, a couple images that I have here, are some rather famous copyright infringement cases. Uh, can anyone tell in the left picture which is Tetris and which isn't? That's right, that's why there was a lawsuit. Well, only because I've done this a lot. <laughs> okay, well yes, except for the video game lawyers in the room. Uh, in the middle, you have Flappy Bird, and on the right, you've got Pac-Man and a game called Casey Munchkin, which is actually one of the first copyright cases that we have. And I'm just going to steamroll right into trademarks, because that's how fast we're moving today. Uh, trademarks typically come in two different flavors. There are <coughs> word marks and design marks. Word marks are exactly what they sound like. They protect a word. Uh, design marks protect images, logos, uh, some larger encapsulation of your brand. Here I have Candy Crush Saga and Candy Crush Saga. One of them is a word mark, one of them is a design mark. Who thinks the design mark is the one with the picture? You're paying attention or you're asleep. Uh, when you look at a can of Pepsi, the word Pepsi is your word mark and then the logo is obviously going to be your design mark. 
Are some marks better than others? Yes. Uh, when it comes to trademarks, the key word is distinctiveness. How unique is your brand? Because trademarks are all about brand recognition. It's all about setting your goods or services apart from other people's goods and services. So obviously you want to have a brand that is easily recognizable, unique, uh, something that makes you different from everyone else. Calling your game Jewel Block Crush Puzzle is not unique. It is the most generic kind of descriptive uh, name that you can give to something. Now naming your game company Sega, which is a word that is invented by smashing the game, the words service and games together, is very unique and very recognizable, especially when you add to it unique color schemes and fonts. So if you are a game developer out there or any kind of creative trying to create a new brand, something to keep in mind is how unique is that brand? Because ultimately that will determine how protectable that brand is when it comes to trademark registrations. So now that we're all familiar with some very basic info on what a trademark is, your next question is probably, okay, sounds great, Ross, how do I get one? Don't file your trademark registrations yourself. You can Please drive your car don't. with your feet, but that does not make it a good idea. You should drive it with your hands or hire a professional driver. Uh, trademarks, the same way. Uh, if you hire an attorney to register your trademark for you, the first questions they'll probably ask you, and we all ask our clients this, is generally, Okay, so you want to register that name. Where does that name come from? Did you make it up? Is it new? And then the question after that is usually, what goods or services are you trying to protect? What is the thing that this brand name is now being ascribed to? Because the USPTO divides all of its trademarks into classes that cover everything from software to chocolate soda. And as a video game attorney, as a trademark attorney, one of the most important things for you to designate is the appropriate class for the mark you're filing for. You want to make sure that whatever class that you are filing in is the most appropriate class for that good, and also do a trademark search to make sure that that mark is available in that class. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people try to file marks that are already taken in the wrong class, and it's, it's a very messy thing. It gives me a headache. Um, I've included on this slide a couple different classes that apply the most to video games and board games. 941 and 42 are usually the most common that I run into. But even after you get a trademark, be careful, you still might get into some kind of trademark trouble. And this is where we can talk about issues of infringement, licensing, and branding. Uh, the, one in my fav the one in the middle is my favorite, Nuka-Cola. Uh, there might be trademarkable content in your game that isn't even real. Uh, Nuka-Cola was a fictional brand included in the Fallout series, which wound up on t-shirts and fan art and is fan product so often that they ended up pursuing trademarks for it, even though it wasn't a real product. Uh, on the right, does anyone know what game that is with the Wave Runner? Wave Race 64, that's right. Do you notice anything weird about that picture? That's true. Um, I'll, I'll give you a hint. In the background, there's something that didn't exist in 1996. Right, exactly. So this was a game that came out on the Nintendo 64 and had a licensing deal with Kawasaki. In the background of a lot of these maps were banners that featured the Kawasaki logo and trademark. When that game was later re-released on the Wii console, they did not renew that licensing agreement with Kawasaki. So what does Nintendo do? They replace all the Kawasaki branding with Nintendo Wii branding. Pretty clever, and it's also because trademarks uh, are something that Nintendo is very aware of. Um, okay, so, good, I'm ahead of schedule, fantastic. So, moving out of trademark, something that we talked around a little bit today but didn't get directly into is business incorporation, and more specifically what I'm going to talk about is business incorporations for indie devs. Uh, do any indie devs or game developers in the room have a corporate entity? Cool, okay, the most common corporate entity that I run into in my practice is the Limited Liability Corporation. There are others. There are S-Corps, there are C-Corps. Uh, some folks do general partnerships. I, I wouldn't advise that because I'm not giving advice today. I'm just giving it One time, and it was really weird. <laughs> it's, not, it's not good. Uh, so one of the reasons that game devs and small entrepreneurs choose LLCs the most often is because it's one of the most versatile forms of incorporation that we have. It's very easy to register an LLC. It's very easy to change the structure of an LLC, and when I say structure, I mean board of directors that you have on it, uh, addresses, agents, practical information that you might want to shuffle as your company grows, as your team changes, as your location changes. 
And one of the other reasons that it's the most popular is because it's relatively one of the more inexpensive ones. Uh, in Illinois, that's a little less true since we have one of the more expensive LLCs, but you're looking at approximately $600 in filing fees plus whatever fees uh, fall to your lawyer. Do we have any questions so far about trademarks or LLCs or anything I've covered in the last like two minutes because it seems like I've been <laughs> flying through all of this? All the way in the back. Actually, we have a microphone in the middle aisle if you want to come up and hear it, or if you belt it out, I can repeat it for you. Do you have a preference in jurisdiction for LLCs? Uh, being in Illinois and being licensed to practice in Illinois, all of the LLCs I file are here. Uh, I, I know the way the system works here. It's very reliable for my clients who are here. Um, they, they kind of vary state to state in terms of filing requirements and annual reporting, but I haven't had any issues with Illinois yet, so I'm a fan. Why not Delaware? Why not Delaware? The question I answer more often is why Delaware? Because right, that's right, one of the right. first questions I get from folks. They're like, well, doesn't everyone register their company in Delaware? Uh, the biggest draw to registering in Delaware is that the law is very settled there. It's very clear to people who do this all the time how any given dispute is going to come out in Delaware just because they're a very corporate-friendly state and the you know, legislation is very well settled there. So if you're filing in Delaware, you can get a very fair expectation of what's going to happen if you get into trouble. Uh, that in and of itself is not the only reason to file there. There's also lots of tax incentives for filing in Delaware. But one thing that you have to keep in mind is with any business, you have to have a local agent in that jurisdiction. So if you have no business in Delaware, if you have never sold a product there, if you have no people that are part of your business living there, uh, you're going to have to get around the issue of having an agent in that jurisdiction as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Does everyone file for everything in Delaware, or are there specific things that are better to file for Delaware? Like what kind of things? Uh, like, would you prefer to file an LLC in Delaware, or copyright, or trademark, or all of them? It's a good question. Uh, so copyright and trademark are actually federally handled. Okay. So if you're filing for a copyright, that's going to be with the Library of Congress. If you're filing a trademark, uh, most people go for the federal. Now, there are state trademarks as well. Okay. Uh, federal trademarks, there are some advantages to filing with the USPTO in that uh, it's our national trademark system. It's well known to everyone. Uh, it's the most, again, the most settled. Uh, so I would always advise going federal on those two things. And then LLCs? And then LLCs, uh, usually it's where you're living or where you're doing business most of the time. Uh, exceptions for that is if you are a national wide corporation, you have many offices in many many offices in many different places. It might make more sense to go in one place or another, depending on tax incentives or so, other things. So, for example, if you have um, if you're online and you have everyone working remotely, you file with the leader of that group, then file for an LLC where they're at, or could they potentially file wherever? That could be one way to do it. Uh, some places that you might look to answer that question would be your own bylaws of that business to see who might own a controlling stake, where you're doing the most business. There's a lot of different factors in determining the best jurisdiction for something like that. Uh, that's a very specific question. So I want to keep it a little bit general, and I want to leave. Yeah, I might want to pick up on that so uh, question. That is in, actually in a minute. great transition. Perfect. All right. And great. That Sam's <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about contracts. Uh, we've gotten some things about contracts earlier today, I'm, so I don't want to go through like. Here's what a non-disclosure agreement looks like. Here's what a publication agreement. That they're going to be so different anyway. That wouldn't be useful. Um, but uh, I do just want to go over some some high-level basic sort of things as to what, or at least questions I, I get uh, from time to time. Like, do I really need to get that in writing? That's one, one I hear uh, from time to time. And you might be surprised to learn the answer is no. Actually, a contract can be a formal written document. You know, the part of the first part and the part of the second part. We don't use those terms much anymore, but I'm sure you all you all know the the stereotypes on that. Um, it can be that. Uh, I think it should be that. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, an email chain might be enough to show a contract. You can have a purely oral contract where we're just talking to each other and we agree. Um, certain actions, patterns of conduct without talking at all can, in some circumstances, be a contract. And that might be a dangerous thing to let you know. Um, so with, more fundamentally, what is a contract? Uh, black letter law, a contract needs three things. You need an offer, acceptance of that offer, and what's called legal consideration. So an offer, I could say to you, hey, why don't you come by my house tomorrow, mow my lawn, I'll give you 20 bucks. There's an offer. I propose some sort of deal for you. Uh, it's very definite and clear what the terms are. And then you say, sure, yeah, okay. 
there's acceptance. You have accepted my offer on its terms. And legal consideration uh, actually has several different definitions depending on where and, and when you are. Um, but basically, you can think of it as giving up something you didn't have to already. So I'm, about to, I'm going to give you $20. You're going to give up an hour or two of your Saturday you could have spent doing other stuff. We've both given up something in exchange. That's consideration. Uh, a brief corollary to that means it, no consideration means there's not a contract. If someone says to you, hey, I'll do music for your game. Oh, don't worry about paying me. That's fine. I just want to help out. That's great. Uh, you know, thank her profusely. If she bails on you, then there's no contract to be breached. There might be some other rarer legal remedies. Um, breach of contract, it is not. Now, as I said, this can be dangerous information. I can prove I have a contract. Can I sue for breach now? This is something I find myself saying uh, quite a bit lately. There's a difference between can and may and should. Uh, may you sue for breach of contract? Yes. If you can prove that you have a contract and was breached, you have the right to do that. Can you sue for breach? Probably, or at least hire someone to do it for you. Uh, should you do that? Is that a good idea? That's where we're really going to want to sit down and talk about it. Now, I'm not going to say no. There are certainly cases where, yes, it is absolutely worth it to file a lawsuit. Um, but please keep in mind that is the nuclear option. Filing a lawsuit is the nuclear option. Um, there are plenty of other things you can do before you get to that point, like talking to the other person, like having a lawyer come and write. You call them nasty grabs. I call them fun letters because I have a lot of fun with them. <laughs> Um, you know, and those are things to really talk about. Now, here are some things to consider at this point. Money. Um, just in terms of like filing fees to the government and whatnot, depending on what it is and where you happen to be, you're looking at at least a couple hundred bucks to file a lawsuit. That's just filing it. That's not preparing the complaint. That's not paying a lawyer to write the complaint for you. That's not going to court. That's just paying the court to say, let me in, please. Uh, so if I you don't come on my lawn tomorrow and I have to pay someone 30 bucks to do it, I stand, and here's where we're coming to the results, I stand to lose $10. I'm $10 out on this deal. I am not going to file a, you know, spend 200 bucks and a bunch of my own time to sue you for breach of that contract and recover $10. Um, it also means you know, if you bail on me and I get the neighbor boy to do it for 10 bucks, I have lost nothing. I've gained $10 on this deal. I am not allowed to sue you. Or if I do, I will be laughed out of court immediately and probably have to pay your legal fees. Uh, also keep in mind, in all likelihood, you will not be able to make the person do the thing she promised to do. Uh, the, typically, what you're getting is money damages however much you were out. Uh, also, reputation. Um, you have to kind of gauge the, the social benefit of doing this. Do you want to get the reputation as being that guy? The guy who's always ready to threaten a lawsuit or go to court. Uh, we ha in Chicago, especially, we have a very tight-knit, close indie community. Um, if you never want to work with anyone again, that's a really good way to do it. So things you really need to keep in mind. So I don't have to get in writing. Should I get it in writing? Yes. Absolutely. And not just to help put money in the pockets of lawyers, although that is always a very noble endeavor. Um, uh, plenty of other good reasons. It's proof an agreement exists. You know, no one can weasel out of it. Do we really agree? Maybe it's not even nefarious. I'm denying it. I'm not sure whether we actually settled on anything. Oh, yeah, we did. I signed a piece of paper that said as much. That's good. Uh, also, memories fade, especially if it's a long term contract. You know, you're not necessarily going to remember, you know, when the third round of deliverables were supposed to be, but you can look at page three. There it is. Great. Now it's all very clear. Um, it will also can help you think about things you hadn't thought to even agree on or not before. Uh, especially a competent lawyer who does this. We have seen these deals enough. We know what's going on. We know the sorts of things that should be in a contract or should not be in a contract, especially things that should be there that aren't there, we can say, oh, did you think about this or that? What What have you th thought about this? Do you want to do this? You, mm, you might not have thought about that before. Now you can think about it and hammer out the details more. 
and it helps to keep everyone honest. And I, I don't necessarily want to say you know, everyone is out to get you and you can never trust anyone, although I will say that, but <laughs> you've heard enough already today, I think. But, you know, what we really don't want, I think, coming up to my next slide, is this. Look, we don't really need to sign a contract right now, do we? I'm sure we can figure stuff out later. No, that is probably the worst thing you can do. Uh, I, I heard it once put, and it stuck with me, sign an agreement now when everyone is happy and hungry. You are happy because you're all getting together and it's going to be a great job. You're going to make a really cool game. It's going to be awesome. And you're hungry because no one's made a dime and you really need to make this so you can buy groceries next week. Uh, what you don't want to do is, oh, we'll figure it out later. And everyone just kind of starts working. No, there are no real agreements on anything. And nine months later, you have a five-figure publishing deal. And you know what? I did a lot more work than Ross did on that. I mean, he really didn't do anything on that. I did so much more work. He doesn't deserve an even split. Come on. Ross is great, by the way. <laughs> um, but that sort of thing can happen. Many times it does. It, it might not, but it probably will. And when you have a big pile of money sitting on the table, and now you have to divide it up, that might kill the entire – it might kill the game outright because no one can agree how to do it. it. It might ruin the relationships and you can kind of soldier on and get it done and then stab each other in the back afterwards. So really agree at the beginning. This way there still might be some annoyance, some hurt feelings, but at least everyone knows ahead of time what's going on. You have no real right to complain about it. Anything else we should talk about contracts? I'm glad you asked. Uh, make sure you read and understand everything that's in a contract before you sign it. This might seem pretty basic, but I know all of you will just click the I agree button on all your software. Everyone does it. I know. Um, but that's generally not a good idea, uh, especially if it's not the sort of click-through contract terms of service, EULA kind of thing. If it's a publisher agreement or a shareholder agreement or operating agreement for an LLC or something, make sure you know what is in it and what it means. There are times I've read through a contract and I don't know what the other side is talking about, so I can ask. Sometimes it's, whoops, sorry, I don't know what I was doing there. Sometimes we can get it cleared up. Sometimes something very nefarious and we want to say, okay, no thank you, we'll move on. But please under know what you're actually signing. And if you don't know, hire a lawyer to tell you. You should have done that anyway. Um, also, keep in mind, and this has been touched on a bit earlier, but every contract will say something like, this agreement constitutes and contains the entire agreement between the parties with respect to the subject matter hereof and supersedes any prior or contemporaneous agreements, whether written or oral. And that's a long, fancy way of saying anything not written in this contract does not count. Here's the thing. It means what it says. That means exactly that. It's not just for show. And you, as we, we did here earlier, again, you know, oh, we, we never enforce that. Well, we wouldn't enforce it. No, don't worry about it. Or they'll make some sort of promise that's not there. <clears throat> oh, sure, we'll, we'll totally do this. We don't have to, but we'll, we'll totally do that for you. Not necessarily. And, and again, even if you know, you, know you, can, you know you can trust this person implicitly, Especially if you're working f with a big corporation, unless it's like single person, you know, the ownership of that company might change. He might decide you know, two years later to sell the company, and then somebody else comes in. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and now you're dealing with something completely different. Someone who's not going to be as kind and generous to you. Maybe that person gets fired and someone else comes in who knew nothing of this deal and is not willing to play ball. If it's not in the contract and you want it there, get it in there. If it's in there and you don't want it, try to get out of it. Sometimes you have to take bad deals and live with them. I mean, an un unfavorable term or two, but don't necessarily rely on, oh, he told me it would be okay. Might not be. Uh, so now a couple couple specific kinds of contracts I want to get into. Uh, should I get an NDA is a question. And the answer is it depends. Um, we've touched on non-disclosure. Also, um, basically what it is, 
I'm going to tell you about this cool idea I have, and in exchange, you're not going to do it without me, or tell other people who will then do it without me. And, you know, legally speaking, should you have an NDA, everyone should sign an NDA before you talk to them. But again, I am forced to admit, legal concerns are not the only thing you should be concerned about. You have to live your life. I don't. So here's my sort of informal ranking of how worrisome it is you, that you're talking to someone about your idea. At uh, the top are game publishers, people who could easily take your idea, farm it out to somebody else. It never hurts to ask if you're... I mean, usually you have something going for you already. You have information out about your game. That's how they found you in the first place. Um, even so, it never hurts to at least ask, would, would you sign an NDA? We have some things we'd like to keep secret. And typically, I think they'll <clears throat> people will be generally open to that. If not, then you kind of have to take your chances and, and reevaluate things. But I would say definitely at least ask to get an NDA with, with a big game publisher. Um, slightly below that are anyone else you might want to bring on board. <clears throat> you know, contractors, employees, partners, what have you. Um, generally a pretty fair thing to both for the initial interview process and within any sort of um, agreement you have for them to work with you. Um, not unreasonable to ask them not to talk about all the, the secrets you have in your game. Uh, then we below that, we get to other game developers you know who aren't working on your particular project. And yes, it's true, they you know, might be in a position to take your idea and steal it and run with it and beat you to the market, and that would suck. Uh, on the other hand, it is also a good thing to be able to just talk to people about what you're doing. You have a problem figuring out a particular issue in your game, you can go to people and talk about it. Uh, I'm... I show up as a token lawyer to uh, several different game developer meetup groups, um, support groups for game developers, uh, typically they call themselves, um, just, and just talk about what you're doing and what you're working on and get feedback and advice. And that can be useful. Um, and again, so you kind of have to balance, you know, do you want to be that guy who makes everyone sign the NDA, um, especially, you know, the bottom rung on this, grandma at Christmas dinner, if, she, if you're talking to your grandma, she asks you what you've been up to, and you suddenly throw a three-page contract in her face and say, I'm not talking to you, old lady, till you sign this, I had to protect myself. Wait, is that an option? I, again, can, may, should. I got so excited, I was going to say, like, yes, it is. It, you, you can do that. Okay. <laughs> not advisable. I don't know your grandmother. What if your grandma's a game publisher? You know, <laughs> again, they, they, these are these are you know general overviews. You, your specifics may vary. Okay. Yeah, maybe your grandmother is a, a no good old shrew who will absolutely screw you with the drop of a hat. Maybe it's warranted. Probably not. I don't know. Um, and what about so harsh? <laughs> I don't know your grandmother. <laughs> uh, so what about work for hire agreements? Now, I, I know I said earlier, you don't have to have that in writing. Sometimes you do. There are certain types of contracts that do have to be in writing. One of those is a work-for-hire agreement. Uh, in order to actually be a work-for-hire, uh, it has to be in writing, uh, the law says. It has to specifically state work-for-hire. Uh, it has to be eligible subject matter, which includes any contribution to a video game, so you're covered there. Uh, if you're doing something outside the video game space, it might not. Um, has to be signed by the contractor in question. And courts vary on when it has to be signed. Uh, here in the Seventh Circuit, uh, which covers Illinois, Indiana, Wisconsin, has to be signed before the contractor starts working on the content. Other places, you have to agree it's a work for hire before the contractor starts, but you can get around to signing it uh, a little later. Um, best practice, obviously, sign it beforehand. One, that's a good idea anyway. Two, depending on where you are, you have to. Um, and, and so why do you want this? Um, the original, whoever is the original author has certain rights. Uh, if it is a work for hire contract, then you as the hiring party, whether it's you personally or your company or whatever, uh, is deemed the author and all the rights start with you and the contractor never had any rights to begin with. If it's not a work for hire, then the contractor is the author. And the author can give away all of his rights 
um, completely assign them over to you, but he can never give away at that point being the author. He will always have being the author as sort of a right. And there's one very, there are a couple of things uh, that gives him the most important is about 35 years after he gives away any rights, and this, this, there's some really complicated and arcane timing things in here, but roughly 35 years later, uh, he can take them all back. Everything he gave to you, he can take them all back, any or all of his rights. Um, and now you might be thinking, 35 years, I should be so lucky to still be selling copies of this game or its sequels. Good problem to have, right? But uh, i like to point out, um, last year marked 35 years that the game Donkey Kong was first released, which, among other things, is the first appearance of Mario. The year before that was Pac-Man, but I think Mario was probably the uh, most well-known game character ever. Um, and I, I don't know that Japanese <coughs> copyright law works this way, but uh, just hypothetically imagine you could get back the rights to Mario and how much would Nintendo have to pay you to get those back? I think of this. <laughs> or uh, a more Mario-centric example. Um, a, a, a flying ship full of gold and an extra life for yourself is probably about right. So, um, again, 99% of the cases, not going to be a big deal. But you don't want to be the, that 1% where it, that ruins you a couple of decades down the line. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say. Now, I do, I do, you mentioned um, you know, where, where should you incorporate or set up your, your company. That's really going to be up to you and your team. You know, that's something to agree on. You know, you, if you want to be an Illinois LLC, you know, we can, as long as everyone's on board with that, great. If you want to be a Delaware Corporation, fine. If you want to be an Idaho Limited Liability Partnership, why? But sure, <laughs> as long as everyone's willing to do that, you know, that's just, and again, figure that out now. Don't, um, don't wait, don't put it off. Um, typically, if, you know, whoever is sort of in charge of, of things, you know, whoever is really kind of running the show will be the one who will set that up. Um, if no one is really running the show and you're scattered throughout the country or internationally, it might be more difficult, but either way, figure it out. There, there's not necessarily going to be, especially if we're talking international, you know, that's way more complicated than I could even begin. You know, you need a team of lawyers just to figure out what you want to do on that point. But um, figure it out, figure it out now, and, and then just go with it. I, would right, suggest. I think we've got time for one question, and then we have to start the next panel very soon. So who gets to be the one question? All the way in the back. All the Yay. way back there. I'll come up for it. Oh, man. Look at this dramatic walk up to the microphone. I like the Incredible Hulk, man. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, so, Sam, this is a question that I encounter all the time in esports. Um, it's on actually work for hire language. In California, work for hire has a very spe specific meaning. Um, I'm sure that's slightly different here in Illinois. But uh, to what extent do you see uh, employment issues really entering into the esports space with players being independent contractors versus employees? Um, the <laughs> again, that, that that's that's a that's a whole panel or day's worth of, of panels in itself. I mean. What constitutes, even like under Illinois law, what constitutes an employee versus an independent contractor varies depending not only on what you're doing, but what statute you're talking about. Um, there, if in terms of unpaid wages, um, I, I've had to litigate an unpaid wage claim at one point. That definition is super broad. Like you have to try really hard n to not to be an employee uh, there. Um, for like federal tax purposes, there's a difference there entirely. So I mean, it's really going to depend on what you are and who you are and what you're doing. Um, California law is going to have its own things. Um, I mean, if I had to opine on what I think should be happening, that would, <laughs> might be different even than what the law says. And I, I don't practice California law um, uh, in, in that sense. Um, but I mean, I could certainly see there being very obvious claims, um, especially if you know a team owner is trying to stiff a player out of his wages. I could definitely see 
an employee classification in that point. Um, but it, it's really going to depend on, on where you are and what you're doing. Okay, well, sadly, we're out of time for today, so that'll be the only question we have. But we'll be back in five minutes with the last panel of the day, copyrights and tattoos.